Coming up next on Hawaii Now, a University of Hawaii class in political theory invites Congressman Neil Abercrombie to speak on race and politics in the 2008 presidential campaign. It has to do with decades of hope, decades of frustration, decades in which people said, well, when are we going to become who we say we are? He offers a unique perspective. In 1959, he arrived in Honolulu from Buffalo, New York, to enroll as a graduate student at the University of Hawaii Manoa, soon after Hawaii won statehood. It was a time when he would meet and begin a long friendship with two fellow students, the parents-to-be of President-elect Barack Obama. On February 19, 2008, the congressman was invited to UH to reflect on that friendship and to discuss how Barack Obama's Hawaii roots were helping to change the dynamics of race and politics in the United States. That's coming up on Hawaii Now with Congressman Neil Abercrombie. Thank you very much. Mahalo nui for having me today and grateful thanks to Professor Henningsen for uh, allowing me to have the opportunity to get back into an academic setting for once. I've been spending uh, quite a bit of my time uh, in the past few months uh, campaigning for uh, Senator Obama. I will not be campaigning for him today. I took off my jacket that has the Obama uh, sticker on it right now, but I will be trying to hopefully give you some perspective on the question of race and politics uh, from my own uh, uh, personal uh, uh, point of view in terms, uh, uh, in terms of my elected life and, uh, and the movement for civil rights. I'd like to start uh, with uh, uh, pre-Obama. Uh, and by I mean pre-Obama, not Senator Obama today, but uh, Barack Obama Sr. Uh, who came to the University of Hawaii soon after statehood in 1959. One of the interesting factoids that might come out of this election is that 50 years after the uh, advent of Hawaii as the 50th state, the last state to come into the Union, uh, that same year it's possible that uh, a boy born after uh, statehood uh, would become president of the United States. A boy born, born after statehood in Hawaii might become president of the United States. But there are antecedents to all that. There's a history to all of that. When we came to the proposition of race in this uh, world and how it affected us politically, I want you to try and cast your minds back Cast your emotions back, not from today. Go with me back into the last century. Go back with me to the time of statehood in 1959 when I arrived. In the first week of September, two weeks after the advent of statehood in, in the middle of August, August 17th in 1959, and Hawaii became the first state, uh, the 50th state rather, the last state to enter the Union. Part of the element of discussion that took place then and why Hawaii was paired with Alaska coming into the Union was because of the racial composition or presumed racial composition of Hawaii. It was seen as a threat. Believe me, look around this room. Glance at some of, well, you may be discouraged if you look around this room. I don't know how you're going to feel about that. But if you take a look around this room, the physiognomy of this room, is such that it would have been impossible to imagine a classroom configured such as this is today, 50 years ago. Cast your mind back only 50 years and picture a young man coming to the University of Hawaii. Brilliant smile. A black man. Impressive. Charismatic. Compelling personality. Certain of himself. From where? Kenya. What's Kenya? Kenya is a country at this time barely shut of its colonial past. A rebellion had taken place. A revolution had taken place. A bloody rebellion characterized in the West as the Mau Mau Rebellion. A word that still exists that you can still find now when you Mau Mau somebody. What does that mean? Tom Wolfe wrote a, a, a story once using Mau Mauing during the civil rights movement that I'm going to get to in a, in a, in a moment. 
When you mow mouthed somebody, that meant you confronted them. That meant that you, you bullied them. That meant you intimidated them. This came from, from the, the bloody revolution in Kenya against the British colonial and the British Empire and the British colonial administration. So picture this. Uh, young man, your own age. A product of that. So his father, a goat herd. This young man spotted by the colonial administration as a particularly bright young man. They weren't looking for bright young women. The whole colonial administration didn't want that. Oh no, this is still a patriarchy. This is still a hierarchy of colonial administration and empire. Spot this young man. Let's get him some schooling. He can be an administrator for us. Let's pick the best and the brightest out of these colonially dominated regions of the world and bring them into the orbit of, of colonial organization. And so they spot him. And in those days, the United States had as its foreign policy precepts that we would reach out to people. We had libraries. This may strike you as completely strange. But the United States in those days actually tried to set libraries up with books that people could come into freely and, uh, and uh, take them out or do what they wanted. We had scholarships for young men and women to be able to come to the United States, go to any school they wanted, any place they wanted, any way they wanted to do it, as opposed to, as opposed to today when, of course, we show our fist to the world, where we threaten everybody with military intervention and slaughter and, and mayhem as the first order of our approach to other people in the world. In those days, instead, we reached out to people in that manner. And as a result of that, this young man, Barack Obama, was attracted into that orbit of, of influence and decided he would apply for a scholarship and was awarded it and ended up here at the University of Hawaii as the first stop on his intellectual journey. And so we met then. He came here and of course it was easy in those days, still is, the campus isn't that much larger and physically it's not at all. And it was easy to meet people, you'd see them, uh, hello, how are you? Uh, let's get together, would you like to sit down? You know, it was aloha spirit. It was, you know, obviously this person's a stranger. He's come from someplace else, uh, as I had. I came from the East Coast. I had at that time, so by way of a, a, a full disclosure, I had a, a, teaching, assistance, a teaching assistantship in the, in the uh, sociology department, which I think was given to me principally because I came from the East Coast and they wanted some cross-fertilization. It had nothing to do with my scholarly abilities. Um, uh, th they came later. Uh, but uh, uh, they were taking a chance and they wanted it. And so we met and, the, and others met and we talked. And here was this incredibly interesting man. Young man, as I say, with the, I still remember this brilliant smile, big horn rim glasses on, a big booming James Earl Jones voice, uh, full of, uh, of, of confidence. And, and of course, uh, some of us were graduate students, and so we knew everything, and we, we were anxious for everybody else to know that we knew everything. And, and so uh, uh, we met and talked, and there was this incredible fervor. Now, think about it. This is 50 years ago. The world is exploding in freedom. One nation after another, regions of the world, seeking independence, uh, trying to make their own futures, wanting control over their own destinies. And at the same time, we have the beginning of the civil rights, uh, I shouldn't say the beginning of the civil rights movement, because that had obviously gone on from slavery, but the modern, the modern manifestation of the civil rights movement, where people were actually taking the Constitution and saying that it means something. That we had freedom of speech, that you were not supposed to be able to be discriminated against, that you couldn't be prevented from voting and participating in government. And a movement began around that. And this ferment was, un was undertaken. And of course it was going on in Hawaii. That's when you see all this stuff about the 442nd and you wonder, well, what about all the, how, how many times are we going to have award ceremonies for the 100th Battalion and the 442nd? And, what did it all mean? It meant that, that those who had come here from elsewhere and those who were still here, who were not white, who were not Western, who were not uh, a Christian, uh, who had come here as missionaries, not just religious missionaries, but economic missionaries also, had come to dominate the Hawaiian territory. We'd gone from being a pre-feudal kingdom 
to a shotgun republic, to a territory of the United States, to becoming a, a state in, of the Union. All kinds of implications, economically for sure, in land tenure for sure, but particularly uh, implications and consequences for the races and the ethnicities and the, and the cultural groups that were melding here in Hawaii that were sometimes clashing, sometimes being in conflict with one another, but more often than not, having to live and work with one another in an island context. And in the course of events, obviously, intermarriage and, and children being born and relationships being established, economic and social and personal, all taking place in a, in a confined area uh, with these small islands in the middle of the Pacific, 2,500 miles from elsewhere. People coming here under contract, like Senator Noy's mother and father, $12 a month, he found, they found the contract and gave it to him. Six days a week, 10 hours a day, half hour for lunch, it had to be brought to you in the field. Post-World War II then, the ferment with regard to race and ethnicity and personal freedom was taking place all over the world, including the United States and including Hawaii. That's what this revolution was all about, where the territory that had been claimed, the territorial legislature that had been claimed by the, the ethnicities and the, the races and, and the cultures that were here against the, the Western missionary, uh, banker, corporate power structure, manifested itself in, 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 with statehood into the legislature being taken over from what was called the Big Five, the corporate interests that ran Hawaii, that owned Hawaii, and the landed interests there. So the question of civil rights, the question of racial identity, was in ferment all around the world, including Hawaii. And into that context, Barack Obama appears. Very quickly, he meets a young girl. I say a girl because she was 18. You could scarcely say even a young woman at that point, scarcely 18 years old, out of high school, she met him. Now, it was easy to be drawn into the orbit of this very compelling, charismatic man. But at the same time, she was a remarkable person. Put yourself back again, I ask you. 50 years, even now, today, interracial marriage is still, oh, wait a minute. You know, how's that going to work out? Uh, religions, ooh, wait a minute, are we going to mix that up? So you can imagine, put yourself back 50 years ago. Now here's a young girl, now her parents, they originally came from Kansas, and she was white. And what happened? The color side of it, which had informed so much of our political dialogue, not only in Hawaii, not only in the United States, but around the world, was subsumed to affection and love. No, this is not a new story. This is maybe even a romantic story. Uh, this is uh, the kinds of stories that come up over and over again. And I'm looking around the room, and there's some stories here in this room. At one time, and in some time, more recently than 50 years ago, somebody got together for all of you. <clears throat> and, and all of you who are in this room represent an incredible melange of this. Now, why do I dwell on this as, as much as I do? Not because it's inherently more interesting but because of the consequences and outcome that we're facing right now today, here in Hawaii tonight, which is, uh, in which uh, the, the fate of this country in terms of who's going to be president may very well be on, on, on the road to final decision. That's why I concentrate on it, because it becomes a microcosm of, uh, 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 of the entire circumstances of race uh, and politics in this country. They got together, they fell in love, they got married, little Barry was born. Barack Obama, the senator today, was little Barry then. Now what happened? He was born into a context. I'm not going to go into the whole history, subsequent history of, uh, of Barack and his mom. They separated, he went on to, to, to Harvard and, and uh, got his PhD, went back to Kenya. They separated, That's, that, that constitutes another realm of, uh, that I don't have time to pursue today, other than to say that what she had when she brought the, the, to the, what she brought to this union was a young woman, as I say, scarcely 18, uh, who, uh, who on the surface was much different than her husband to be. He was full of, of life and full of himself and, and uh, exuberant and, and, and demonstrative, and she was very quiet. 
uh, on the surface, uh, more an observer than a, a participant. You can imagine, she was 18. She was scarcely uh, into her first uh, months, uh, weeks and months of, of academic pursuit in an entirely new context. The same kind of thing that all of you have experienced when you come up here, all of a sudden you're a whole bunch of people you don't know and, and exposure to, to conditions and circumstances intellectually and otherwise that are new, fascinating, challenging. But she had a sense of adventurous, adventuresome spirit a, about her that, was, that had to be. This is 50 years ago. This was not an easy thing to do. This was, this was someone, this was a woman of extraordinary curiosity and, and perseverance and determination to make this come true for her, to meld her emotional life uh, with, with her sense of where she wanted to go in the world. And so little Barry came into that. And what then did he come into? The culture of Hawaii. And what was happening in Hawaii? What was happening in the nation at that time? This is the civil rights movement. Now, he's a child, but his mom and dad are the products of the 50 years that come before that, the generation before that. And what happened in this country then, and that, in which I participated in, so I'm, I'm giving you this all as an observer that, I, that I've gone through with them, was the blossoming of the civil rights movement. So that you have a situation where a woman told me yesterday, uh, a, 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 a lady who's been involved in the civil rights movement all these years, now in her twilight years at the Obama rally yesterday, who said with tears in her eyes, a black woman that I've known here uh, of uh, all, all of the last 50 years and, and who was involved in it for years before that. She says, I've been dreaming this dream all my life and now my dream is going to come true. Think about that. What an extraordinary thing. This is not an abstraction anymore. This is not a hope. Someday, someday, somewhere, somehow, this romantic notion, it won't be us, but maybe it'll be our kids or our grandkids, somewhere down the line. We're, we're going to be on the short end. It's not going to happen for us. I can't succeed at the things I want to do and who I want to be, but maybe somebody else will. Well, now that's here. I'm getting chicken skin when I talk about it. Now it's here for those of us who went through this time and period, decades, when the senator says, you know, we are who we are waiting for. Now, there are pundits out there, what does that mean? People who went through this whole civil rights period know exactly what that means, know precisely what that means. Doesn't, that doesn't need translation at all. What it means is we're not waiting. It is here. It's in three dimensions, which, is in, which informs why there is a sense of excitement across the country. But think about it. Think about it. what it would be if you went, and I say you, it can be any of us, including me, the uh, holly boy from the East Coast coming to, uh, coming, coming to Hawaii. Think about, it if, about what it would mean if you went to sit down for lunch at the, at the big city diner in Kaimaki and somebody came up and smashed you in the head with a baseball bat for sitting down and ordering some food. Now, let me tell you something. That's real. That happened. And let me tell you, being white didn't protect you because if you were sitting there with the guy or the gal who was sitting there who was the wrong color, you got probably two shots in the head because you were a traitor. You were a traitor to your race. The last thing on earth you could be is a white ally of anybody that was trying to pursue civil rights. And let me tell you, it didn't help you any to say, well, you know, I'm almost white. You know, I'm, 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 I'm this, I'm that, and the other thing. I can pass. We don't even know what that means these days. I bet if I took a, uh, well, I won't take a survey right now. But we know what passing meant. What passing meant was is you could hide who you were. You could get away with who you were. If you knew who you were, if you weren't struggling with who you were, which, of course, is what happened with Senator Obama. People look back and they say, what are you talking about? He went to Punahou. Everybody liked him. He was a nice guy, as if there was no inner life going on. Nobody trying to decide inside who he or she was. Don't forget, he came into a situation in which his father abandoned him. His father had other priorities. His father left his mother. No, this is not a strange thing to maybe some of the people in this room, that there's a one-parent family raised by a single parent, maybe the, most likely the mom. That's not strange. But I'll tell you what, I don't care who you are, who you think you are now, every single person to, for, for whom that has happened, particularly in an interracial 
uh, marriage is, is at some point in their life trying to figure out who am I, what am I all about, how does it work, what's my relationship to myself in the world. Doesn't mean it can't be successfully concluded. But this is part of the framework of decision making uh, that, uh, that Senator Obama had to make and others by the thousands and hundreds of thousands and in fact millions have had to make about who am I? What am I all about in this context in the United States of America that says one thing about itself? But manifestly, in my eyes, and in my experience every day is doing something else. When it comes then to the question of racial politics in this country, it has been the underground assumption, scarcely spoken in public, that yes, we are a nation of freedom. Yes, we are a nation of opportunity. Yes, we're a nation of justice. So when somebody says, well, does that mean that somebody from uh, a, a different race could be elected President of the United States? Does that mean someone with a gender other than male could be elected uh, President of the United States? The single most visible practical manifestation of what it means to be able to pursue everything that you could be or might want to be or aspire to be President of the United States. Now, that wasn't true. I have campaigned for him uh, in uh, rural Iowa, in northern Nevada. I mean, they got me out in the, in the boonies everywhere, in central North Dakota in the wintertime, OK, in the middle of December, northern Minnesota in the Iron Range, Wisconsin. Uh, well, and, and part, for good reasons. I'm from Hawaii. So they figure it's a draw, right, in rural North Dakota. Who would be crazy enough to come to North Dakota in the middle of winter from Hawaii? Let's go see this curious person. And uh, so that's what it is, especially because we've already called them five times asking them to, to vote for Barack Obama. And maybe if he makes a call and says he's from Hawaii, they'll say, this is a trick, right? to get me to listen to you on the phone, because you're from Hawaii. Who would be mad enough to come to North Dakota? So it was, that's part of it. And, uh, and, and, and as a result, I've had this exposure to an extraordinary cross-section uh, of the United States and, and its people over these past months uh, to account for this phenomenon. The reason for this, and the reason for this, this, this phenomenon that has hit, has hit Senator Clinton's campaign, uh, is, you know, how can this be? Where did he come from? What's it all about? It has to do with decades of hope, decades of frustration, decades in which people said, when are we going to really live up to way, uh, uh, what we say? Well, when are we going to become who we are, who we say we are? What is this all about? And the combination, the presentation of self by Senator Obama is such that there is this wave of excitement and stimulation and, interestingly enough, belief so what has happened here, the phenomenon here, is the single greatest, uh, de most destructive element of the falsehoods that we have about ourselves in life, race, is now being confronted by this campaign because the opposite reaction is set in, one of hope and optimism and, and, and a sense that the page of history is about to turn in a positive way. And people wanting to participate in it and feel they are participating in it. And by participating in it, they're not a sucker. They're not a sap. They're not a fool. That it's real and it's tangible. It has three dimensions. And so that's the phenomenon that's taking place. Now, how it works out and whether it will work out, I don't know. Everything's trying to pull it back down. Everything is trying to trivialize it. Everything is trying to parse it and shape it and twist it in such a way as to make you think you are a sap and you are a fool and that it's not real and that it won't work and that it inevitably will collapse. Everything is working then to try and bring you back to the, to the everyday perception of politics as, a, as a one big hustle, as a, as a corrupt enterprise that, that has no possibility of redemption. And so as a result, when you see, when you experience, as I have this phenomenon of, of people believing again in themselves, it comes down to a basic fact that I think speaks well of Hawaii and which the senator spoke about himself in this regard. Here our diversity defines us rather than divides us with all of the difficulties that we have, with all of the pressures to do otherwise. 
and to think otherwise and to act otherwise. Basically, those of us who live in Hawaii want to believe and want to act on the principle that our diversity defines us rather than divides us. We see what happens when diversity divides people elsewhere. You don't have to look further than Kosovo. Yesterday, I've been to Kosovo. I know what's going to happen. I know what's underway there. Division. Look at East Timor. Look at Palestine and Israel. Look at, uh, at Chechnya and, uh, and, and Russia. Uh, look at, at all the divisive, uh, 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 all, of the, all of the divisions, all of the, all of the confrontations, all of the conflicts that end up in, in blood and torture and horror and pain and killing and threats. Look at, the look at the foreign policy of the United States right now. As I, I, as I indicated, our fist in the air. You're with us or against us. We'll pound you senseless. Get in our way, we'll show you. You don't do what we want, the consequences are there. The military option's not off the table. You see, this is what's being confronted now with this campaign. This is what this is about. Our diversity, we want to say the diversity in this world will change it. Will, that will change, that we'll have a changed perception. I can tell you this in my travels as a member of Congress. People all around the world are hoping this campaign is going to turn out to have a new president that's going to be the senator. Again, I'm not giving you a speech for him. I'm, I'm telling you this is the objective facts of, of, of existence. People all around the world believe that there will be a new way of looking at them, that they will be seen as persons whole, as they will be, they will be understood to have aspirations and, and, and a desire for life, that they will not be just put into those categories. So the conclusion that I have for you today is with this, this truncated, as I say, in this brief history of, of race and politics, not only in this country, but, but, but the, the, uh, the, the consequences for the world right today, is that we now have an opportunity, I think, to change the very definitions of what constitutes politics today, to uh, reinsert ourselves as, as human beings into the political process in a way that gives us all a sense that our participation is not just abstract and academic, but real and vital in our lives. And that's an exciting place to be. And uh, I can tell you, as someone who has come decades waiting for this time, it's a wonderful and rich time to be. Political science study is about to become political science reality, and you can be a part of it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, too.